Hello again everyone. Um, today I'm going to try and uh, explain and answer a question that I sometimes get asked, quite often actually, um, why I've got this cutoff date of 1980 at uh, Performance Classics for the machines that I work on. Uh, there's a few reasons for that. Um, I suppose the main one actually is that I'm way too busy anyway with uh, the era that I cover. Work comes in faster than I can possibly cope with it and get it out and I've had to actually sort of um, draw a line under what I'm taking in for a little while to try and play catch up. So that's a good reason and a good enough reason on its own. But um, on top of that, uh, I suppose as we sort of go past 1980, uh, I just sort of lost interest really in the sort of stuff that the factories were churning out and uh, nothing really appealed to me as much as the older things did. And um, <clears throat> I've never been a great fan of Yamahas for instance, but as an example, the old um, two-stroke RDs, I used to like them when they were that sort of slightly sort of round, they had that rounded shaped tank on them and the drum brake with the twin leader. Once they went all square and disc braked and cast wheels and everything, I just, the, the look just didn't do it for me. Um, other, opinion, other, other opinions are available of course, but that was uh, it for me really. Uh, with an exception, and we'll come to it in a moment, but um, I have actually owned three brand new bikes bought in the 1980s and uh, my first was a little 50cc BSA Brigand trail bike and um, I was unfortunate enough to um, have to sort of be lumped in with the 30 mile an hour restriction for 16 year olds and uh, I, I did all the reading up in the magazines and everything and uh, I soon realised that the Brigand was the fastest one in restricted form. I think they were saying it did something like 38 miles an hour. But I also realised that it was about the lightest and it was also, very importantly, the easiest to de-restrict. And I did de-restrict it and it really flew once it had been de-restricted. If you think of fizzies fast, I actually won a bet racing against uh, the so-called fastest fizzy around and I left it for dead on that thing. So anyway, but We'll come back to that as a BSA in a moment, and um, I followed that up with a Suzuki GT200 X5, which, um, all right, it had a disc on the front, and it had cast wheels, and it, they were sort of edging towards the square of styling, although it, it didn't look, I thought it looked nice. Uh, the RD200 Yamaha didn't like it at all. Um, similar looking bikes in a lot of respects, but... The Yamahas were just too square and boxy to me. Uh, I like the Suzuki and I've actually still got a Suzuki X5 today. So um, that was my second bike. So that would have been, um, I think the uh, the Brigand was bought in 1980, I think the end of 1980. And uh, the X5 would have been a year later, 81 I think, if I remember rightly, possibly 82. Um, then I had one more new bike after that. And that was in 1984, I bought myself a Honda, um, one of the V4s, the VF400F. Fantastic bike, very, very capable, very fast, very good fun to ride, hair raising if you wanted it to be. Um, but I just never really got attached to it. Uh, so, I'd already bought a second-hand Honda CB500T, I think, um, Possibly even before I bought the VF, and that had been sidelined. But um, that was dug out of hibernation, and the VF was sold because I just wasn't interested. And I wasn't interested because of all the stuff. I remember hitting 20,000 miles on it and um, doing its first major service, and it was the valve clearances. And the stuff that I had to do to get at them tank off, airbox off, all sorts of other junk out the way just to get at them and then find that nearly all of them were spot on anyway. Uh, I don't know, I just couldn't, um, that was it, I was sort of finished with new bikes. I, I, I never had a new bike since then. I very nearly, in the early 90s actually, bought one of the first generation Triumph Speed Triples. My father bought the Trident, the first 900s to have the uh, engine finished in black. And he's still got that actually, uh, gathering dust unfortunately. But 
the modern stuff just doesn't really draw me in. I'm not interested. Um, if I see more recent bikes and even current bikes, I haven't seen anything that wants me to get on and get involved and right. I know that they're fast. I know that they handle great and they're all singing, all dancing and all. That's not for me though. And the most modern bike I ever rode, I think, was a Honda VTR 1000 Firestorm. And I rode that because for a few years on the run, I looked after it for the guy who owned it and sort of went over it and took it for MOTs and so on. So I had the job of riding it 25 miles each way to where we MOT'd it. And uh, that thing could go like stink. And I think I remember sort of ignoring the speedometer and thinking to myself, go up to where you feel like you're doing about 80 and then look at the speedometer and see what you're actually doing, knowing that it'd be a good bit more. I was blown away when I realised I was doing 135. And I did that once on my Triumph Trident. Oh, on your Trident? Really? Well, yes, I did, because it's got an 850 Norman Hyde conversion on it. The head was done by them, and it's geared up slightly, and its absolute top whack was 135, going by the uh, clocks, anyway. And it was bloody terrifying. And I, as we got flat out, I wondered whether either bike or myself were going to get out of there alive. I immediately, after looking down and seeing the front wheel spindle doing this, it was just a blur, the forks were whipping, I damn near crapped myself, throttled off, sat up, screamed, and I've never been anywhere near that fast on it ever again. But I will remember that experience until the day I dropped dead. 135 on that VTR was just bland, sort of fast cruising. So. I don't need the speed. Speed is not an issue or what they can do. I don't need 200 miles an hour. I don't even really need 100 miles an hour. But I need something that draws me in and gets me involved. And that's where these old bikes come in. And that's just the way I am. Um, maybe lots of people won't really understand that. But I don't need or want a new bike. Uh, cut off date 1980. Well, how come you work on 1990s and younger Royal Enfield bullets I hear some people ask. Well, obviously they are by and large very very similar, the Indian built bullets, to um, what Redditch were churning out much uh, prior to 1980 and um, a lot of the parts are actually fully interchangeable as well so um, I'm not out of my comfort zone with them. I've also worked on a few UCEs, especially the 535 GTs to uh, try and make them go a little bit quicker than they do because they look like they do 100 miles an hour stood still. You're lucky if you can get much more than 80 out of them on the move. Uh, but they can be turned into very capable and uh, fine handling good fun bikes but not as they came out the factory. And um, then we move on to stuff after them, these the new twins and so on. That's great but you get um, I'm not drawn to them either. I've never ridden one. I was offered a ride on one. I just didn't want to because I've got to actually want to get on the bike before I even ride it, really. So it might not be very easy for some people to understand that, but again, that's just how I am. So then we get to the new Royal Enfields, the new Triumphs, and uh, can you believe it, a new BSA? Um, right, well, there's lots of debate and argument about whether they are real or not. Or what. Well, as far as I'm concerned, my BSA 50 that I had in 1979-80, the Brigand, I think uh, most of it was made up of components sourced from Italy, especially the engine and suspension and forks and so on. I think the frame was possibly made in Britain as more than likely the tank side panels and seat. Uh, but I didn't buy it because I was buying, oh, these are the same people that made my BSA Bantam field bike that I bought in 1976 and still have. I bought it because it was the best thing that I could get my hands on. It suited me, the price was right, the performance was good, I bought it. BSA on the side of the tank, great, uh, that's a bonus if you want, you know, but uh, that's not why I bought it. And there seems to be a lot of argument, I got drawn into it recently about the new 
so-called BSA Gold Star made by a company called Mahindra in uh, India. Uh, I've got no axe to grind if you want to buy one of them and uh, it's got BSA on the side of the tank and everything but um, please don't try and tell me that it's from the same firm that built my old Bantam in 1956 or built that Lightning Clubman there because it's not. It's a name that a business or a company bought they've got the rights to the name and they've decided that they will use it on the side of a tank of a bike that they now produce in India. The uh, Triumphs there is a little bit of a tangible connection to the old Triumph of Meriden I suppose in that um, John Blow bought up the remains of Meriden demolished it, built houses built a new factory and I think when he opened up the new factory there were some of the old Meriden people taken on there as far as I know but uh, anyway you know the Triumphs are fine bikes again uh, but uh, do I want one? No. Uh, the Royal Enfields I got quite excited when the Interceptor and Continental GT Twins came out until I learned that they had a 270 de degree crank. They sound like a V-twin. I like a twin that sounds like a twin. I can do 360 degrees like that BSA and I love the sound of a 180 degree twin like my Honda CB500T. 270 to me it just sounds like a V-twin and um, I've never owned a V-twin. I've ridden a couple, I've never wanted one. Um, again all my own opinion right I'm just trying to explain to the people who ask why I am the way I am about these bikes, why I got the cutoff date of 1980, why I'm not interested in stuff made after that and um, why I sort of get what people are saying with the, uh, the Royal Enfields, the Triumphs, the BSAs. Great! Yeah, all these names are around again, but I can't really sort of connect with them in the way that I can with the original offerings from uh, much longer ago. And I'm busy enough with all these old things. I love working on them. I love riding them. I've got the dream job. Why should I even worry about what they made after 1980? So. Uh, there's plenty of other people who can take care of that stuff and I'll just carry on with my head in the sand enjoying doing what I do with these old dinosaurs. Myself included, I'm an old dinosaur too. Knocking on 60 next stop. Cheers!